So let's start off by understanding uh, this metaphor that is very compelling of computer memory. And as the cognitive revolution uh, took hold in the 1960s, we know that the computer, the, the standard digital computer became a really important analogy for understanding how the mind works. Random access chip-based memory that's in a computer makes a lot of sense in terms of our kind of short-term working memory, this ability to kind of have information that we're actively thinking about and holding on to for a short period of time. And then uh, we also have this longer term memory, and that's really what we're talking about when we talk about that kind of episodic memory, those nostalgic long term memories somehow seem to be shuffled off into some mental hard drive, some mental hard disk. Um, and in a computer, these properties of short, fast, temporary kind of active memory uh, in RAM versus this kind of longer term, more durable, uh, but slower kind of uh, episodic memory, uh, that, that metaphorically makes sense. But we don't have anything like RAM or a hard disk in our brains. There's just nothing kind of functionally uh, equivalent to that in the biology of the brain. So how is it that we could still have this very compelling seeming mapping between RAM and hard disk kind of memory and yet not have something like that in our brains. And you know, if you took this analogy literally, you'd say, well, the hippocampus is kind of like a hard disk. And maybe you could make that case in certain ways, again, metaphorically, but uh, you know, it's made of the same neurons that are everywhere else in the brain. All these synapses are everywhere in the brain. So what is it really that's going on here? The key thing to understand, and hopefully this will make sense now that we uh, have built up all this understanding of neuroscience, that there are two basic neural mechanisms that can support memory. One is the active firing of neurons. So neurons fire action potentials, um, and because they're firing these action potentials, they're exciting other neurons, and because those neurons are bidirectionally connected with each other, um, they actually send information back, and you get this kind of reciprocal activity among neurons, this kind of collective pattern of activity among neurons. And that kind of collective activity has a tendency to persist, right? All these excitatory messages going back and forth among the neurons, that excitation will tend to persist over time. And at some very abstract level, persistence over time is the definition of memory. Um, and so that's a form of active memory just like RAM, it's the kind of active contents of what's in your brain. But if you start to think about something else and, and you know, walk into a new room or get interrupted in some train of thought, you can lose that contents of memory and it's gone, right? And we all have that experience of like, I was just about to say something really important and now I've totally forgotten what it is. Um, so that kind of experience is in, is reflecting a new pattern of activity coming in in the brain and kind of overturning that prior activity. And if that activity didn't lead to synaptic changes somewhere, which is the second mechanism we're going to talk about, um, then it, it can just disappear and it's gone. Okay. The neurons no longer fire. That persistence that they were causing by kind of talking amongst each other is gone and you lose the memory. You lose that train of thought. So that's actually pretty interesting mapping onto this concept of RAM, but it's every neuron. Every neuron has activity. So it's not like there's a specific part of the brain that only has active neurons. The active neurons are distributed throughout your brain, and but it is that kind of state, that property of the neurons, their activity, that can be mapped onto this uh, kind of short-term transient active form of memory that we think about as this kind of RAM in a computer. On the other hand, you have synapses. And as we saw in the learning chapter, uh, the change in synaptic strength is what drives learning. And these changes uh, known as long-term potentiation and long-term depression, that long-term aspect of them is exactly what we think of in terms of this long-term offline hard disk kind of storage. Um, and so the, the changes in synaptic strength really are the basis for long-term memories. Uh, and in particular, we saw it's the change in the number of amper receptors 
uh, and the postsynaptic side under control of calcium, that's the kind of key driver of most of synaptic plasticity, at least in the cortex. And so that change, the number of AMPA receptors in your postsynaptic side of, of each spine in your brain is really what that memory is. That, again, all those kind of amazing, subjective, nostalgic uh, feelings of, of memory boil down to ultimately those changes in AMPA receptor density in the postsynaptic side. And again, just like with activity, these synapses are everywhere, right? Every, every neuron has 10,000 synapses, roughly speaking. So, you know, it's not like there's a part of the brain that has, you know, all the synapses and there's no synapses somewhere else. So uh, again, there isn't like a separate structure in the brain that does this kind of long-term memory. This long-term memory is everywhere. And so this is really the important thing that we get from understanding neuroscience and how the brain works is that both active memory, this kind of RAM-like memory, and long-term memory, these changes in synapses are distributed throughout the brain. Uh, and so now we need to sort of understand how that uh, these, these two kind of basic neural mechanisms interact with the functional organization of the brain to produce what we typically describe from a more kind of behavioral cognitive type of perspective as like the standard systems of memory. The summary point here is the brain has memory throughout it. Every place in your brain has the capacity for short-term firing, activation, and synaptic plasticity. And therefore, when we go back and, and label all those different kind of parts of the brain in terms of their functions, as we did in the neuroscience chapter, um, that really gives us a map of uh, how memory is distributed across the cortex, for example. And so, you know, visual memory is in visual cortex, auditory memory is in temporal cortex, etc. And so everything is kind of distributed according to the basic distribution of functional specialization. And in every place you have a short-term activation-based form of memory, neural firing that can persist over a very short period of time, uh, and then also long-term synaptic changes. So at some level, it's very simple, right? We already understand a lot about the functional specialization. And now we just have these two different dimensions, activation versus synaptic changes. And you put those two together and you basically have the whole story. So at some level, memory is quite simple and straightforward from this neural perspective. That doesn't prevent uh, standard kind of memory theorists from coming up with a whole set of different terminology <laughs> to describe all the different manifestations of memory. And so, yeah, basically we're just going to try to reconcile uh, that simple neuroscience-based story with kind of the standard uh, cognitive level description of memory, more the phenomenological description of memory. And then we'll come back and think about how the hippocampus supports this really important episodic form of memory uh, so particularly.